listening to The Donor Doctor Show, where your host, James Newberry, will help you improve the health of your fundraising. Now over to Jane. Hello, this is The Donor Doctor, and I'm with my friend, Stuart McLean of McLean Direct again. Say hi, Stuart. Hi, Stuart. And uh, we're here to talk about Robert Collier. He's one of the greats. Uh, I made fun of him the uh, before saying his letter was tedious, but it, it's it's really worth reading. You, you learn a lot. He's talking about Robert Collier, not me. That's <laughs> you're not tedious. Anyway, uh, last week uh, I uh, I mentioned that uh, I was writing a book. Of course, I finished the book. It's an editing process. You you took a look at it and you found it helpful. Yeah, I, I think uh, people are going to uh, find that it, you have a different perspective, as I told you, on things. And I think it'll awaken people's creativity if they take the time to read it. Yeah, um, I think I put more emphasis on the carrier. The, the uh, I call it a carrier rather than an outer envelope because it's not always an envelope. That's, that's one thing. I think, I think words matter. Like, I don't like to say I write fundraising letters because that puts such emphasis on the letters that you maybe forget about the reply form, the inserts, the, the, you know, the, the carrier itself, and things like that. You know, the carrier may, at least for me doing this for 30 years, has proven to be one of the most difficult elements. And I was uh, schooled in the philosophy of uh, the letter, too, what a big deal it was and how much work to put into it. And it is a lot of work, especially if you're going by the idea that the first line is to get to re somebody to read the second line, and you really put thought into that. But, uh, you know, nobody gets to those wonderful words that you've chiseled on the tablet if they haven't opened your carrier. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I read one of my letters that did really well. It, had, it was very personal. It was urgent. Uh, she uh, shared her sorrows, which, which, which is often a good idea. Uh, if you have a good relationship, it's always a good idea, actually. But there was a, you know, I said, uh, my sister said, well, I mean, isn't that what they all do? You know, don't they all, aren't they all, you know, make a strong uh, plea for money? And, and the truth is, no. And we're looking at a letter uh, from a group. Uh, so it's uh, it's a museum in the Museum and Historic Niche uh, site. It was interesting. I just came back from vacation, uh, in, and I was it was on the TV and uh, the local. They're part of the TV station in that, in that market, and talking about how bad they were doing. They were looking for tax relief, but in this letter, and they do one thing I like. It's a sustainer program which I, I had a podcast earlier on the importance of sustainer programs, but you would not have any idea that they're having financial difficulties. I've read the letter twice. There's no mentioning it. There's no PS. There's no flattery. I mean, it's, it's not a good letter. Well, looking at this, and I won't say the organization because I'm not here to dump on anybody, but I, uh, I'm thinking about it, and... Uh, as I've scanned it, it it's, the letter just has no relationship building whatsoever. The only thing personal about it is the personalization from That's the right. computer. That's right. That's a And, you know, there's just really nothing here that made me feel good about it. It doesn't even tell me how long I've been a supporter. And no. This is a cause I really believe in. I went there as a kid. Uh, I've been there probably the, at least ten times. I'm, I'm concerned about their future, but you would not know from, from the appeal that they have a financial. And, and I have to think that it goes to pride. Uh, Claude Hopkins, when he was talking about uh, why people didn't do um, uh, going out of business sales, mm -hmm. of course they do now, but back in the time they didn't, it was, they, they, they didn't want to admit that. So they just go broke. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, uh, pride go for the fall kind of situation. Well, I'll tell you... That certainly has changed because there's a, uh, uh, and I haven't heard about it for a while now, but for about eight or ten years, I'd be driving around. Oh, yeah, there's lots of groups that do that. To the all-news station <laughs> here in uh, you D.C. Have to make, you have to, yeah, to, to have a really good going out of business sale, you have to make it really credible. No, this is the real thing. You know, kind of. Yeah. Well, anyway, let's get to Robert Collier. Uh, he lived from 1885 to 1950. You're familiar with Collier's Magazine or Collier's Publishing? Yeah. That was his uncle. Uh, he was an Irish immigrant. Uh, he's, he was going to be a priest. Instead, he's mostly known for writing self-help books. 
uh, he's, he's also no, uh, known for writing this book, the Robert Collier Letter Book, on marketing. But just like Herschel Gordon Lewis is actually more known for horror films than, than what we think of him as as advertising and fundraising uh, books. So, you know, he's, you know, talented people are often good in, in many things. Uh, here's a few of his uh, quotes from Secrets of the Ages and else, elsewhere. Very few persons know how to desire with sufficient intensity. They do not know what it is feel like that an intense, eager, longing, craving, insistent, demanding, ravenous desire, which is akin to the persistent, overwhelming desire of the drowning man for a breath of air, of the shipwrecked or desert lost man for a drink of water, or the famished man for bread and meat. So you, you have to have desire. Uh, forgiving, you have to sow before you can reap. You have to give before you can get. Of course, that has fundraising applications. We do that all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, imagination. Pictures, pictures help you to form the mental mold. See things as you would have them be instead of as they are. Of course, we try to draw mental pictures in our writings with words. Yeah. Uh, you had said something about your sister. You know, doesn't everybody make a good case for their their money in a letter? And the thing of it is... You're right, they don't. They just ask for money. It's like what they want, rather than helping you reach your desires of doing something important or being involved in something greater than yourself. Or, a sense of belonging. Yes, yeah, a sense of community. Uh, yes. This uh, museum group you just showed me here that I'm looking at, there is no sense of community here. There they really just, should be, though. They just shoot off right from the beginning uh, you can give by credit card and blah, 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 you know. Did you know we have a sustainer program? You know, it's, it's all about what they want. And there's, there's nothing there that creates desire for me or makes me want to get into that monthly giving program. And I'm not talking about getting some premium on the back end, although that's not necessarily a bad thing. But uh, there's nothing there that made me answer the call. To make me feel stirred, you know, because this is a group I care about already. I've given to them once. There's nothing here that makes me want to give again. Well, anyway, anyway the book is 26 chapters. My particular version is not even numbered. I, I got a defective <laughs> batch, I think. Uh, but and, and it's not an easy read, and you wouldn't want to read it all in one day. It's probably best to read a chapter or two. They're not too long. A day, you know, for a month. This might be something you would do, um, you know, turn off the TV in the morning and, and read Robert Collier a letter book, and I think you'd be uh, rewarded. I'm going to start with discussing Chapter 3, where he discusses envelopes, because that goes to my, my feelings about envelope being the way you should start. He says, as a rule, catchphrases, that's what he calls teasers, are effective only in third-class mail, and often the plain look wins in bulk mailings, too. With first-class mail, a catchphrase defeats the purpose of a, you know, the first-class mailing. Better to save the money and mail bulk. Very size and look of envelope. Um, sometimes if your name is already associated with being a, uh, a mailer, mm -hmm. he says use logos or some other way. So people don't know what it is on the outside. Of course, that depends if you, where, where your positioning is. He says effective teasers are scarce. But, you know, it's not, these, are, these are just guidelines, they're not rules. He says that too. And, and they they're, they're change over time if there's overuse. For the little nature library, they double the no number of orders by lithographing a nature scene of birds and woods and flowers across the, the top side of letterhead. But often, plain beats the ornate. Now, you, for the Nature uh, Conservancy, did you do that? I've worked on the Nature Conservancy a couple of times, and one of the classic letters that I'd seen in another book was their control for years, and it had a crane right. looking startled on the front of it, and uh, it had mm. uh, some teaser about, uh, uh, oops, you just stumbled into his nesting site or something like that. And I, that, that did so well for them for years, and they did some variations on it, and then it stopped working. And then after a couple of years, they came back to it again in another version, and it started working again. And I, you know, we were trying to figure out how things work. I always thought that that worked 
because it stopped me when I'm going through my pile of mail and it promised me a story. You know, yeah, so that's what it's I'm an odd thinking. looking bird. Yeah. He does have it. And the cu- bird looks startled. He was like, huh? <laughs> it's a curious looking bird. Yeah. When a group is built around a popular p- personality, he mentioned Albert Hubbard. It's not a household name anymore. Uh, but Ooh. he was—he <laughs> was a big dude a hundred years ago. <laughs> There's not a lot of famous Alberts anymore. Uh, put their picture on the letterhead, and, and often that's a good idea. Though I do know one troop support person that they actually did worse with her na- uh, picture on the letterhead. I don't know what that says. <laughs> let's let's remain nameless here. <laughs> Another effective attention getter is to tip on the letter a sample of product after, offering. For example, if you're uh, you know you're selling a, a bag, leather bag, you you give them a sample of the leather it's going to be that kind of thing, or cloth and an overcoat. He said folders get a better response. Um, well, it didn't work for me recently, so I mean I don't know. Well, uh, folders uh, uh, can work really well if you're doing high dollar fundraising right. and you're asking you know for a thousand dollars or more or naming rights and you have a very information heavy sophisticated appeal and i think the folder does well because people see a value in it they're sure. afraid to just throw it out well, it stands out yeah uh he likes pseudo telegraphs uh, those don't work as well anymore because this is a hundred years ago uh, they might have they might well have you know been. an interesting thing is uh, years ago western union uh, had to start competing in the marketplace, mm-hmm. and I know this might be twenty years ago or so. And uh, the Western Union rep came through trying to get us to use their product, their Graham product, mm-hmm. which is is good for fundraising, but the cost was way up there. But his argument was, well, you know, you got the words Western Union on here. That's what's going to get it open. So uh, I tested it between our company's own. Uh, designed Graham type product uh, that was yellow and had holes down the side, computer holes, you know, and uh, guess what? They both pulled the same. So it didn't matter. It didn't and matter. And money. And we saved money. The Western Union didn't make it. Well, one thing else he says, stamps beat meter in Indicia, which is usually the case today, too. Uh, he said... Postage on on the on the carrier two two centers I'll pull one four cent a brown one point uh, one and a half cent they don't have this anymore obviously looks like a four cent so it pulls better than a green one cent but no better than two half cent stamps it's an interesting uh, well you know stamps help you know uh, that that's interesting um, one of the things that you'll notice that you yourself whoever is listening to this when you get your mail and you're sorting it and whether you're going to open it or not. If there is no teaser on the outside, it's just a plain envelope, uh, you're going to look at the postage. And if it says just bulk mail stamped in the corner, printed in the corner, and there's nothing else there, you're going to be tempted to just chuck it. Well, I don't know. People will have a hard time checking it. Well, I don't I don't have a problem, but uh, if you have something with... Uh, uh, mailers cancellation, yeah, for right. example, you're with right. nonprofit, that tends to add a certain sense of like it's really mystery real. to it. Yeah, yeah, sure, you're right. Um, he said folding of letter can matter. Head out, uh, so so that only the salutation of first line of letter can be seen. Sometimes helps, not a lot, but 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 enough to to make it uh, worthwhile to do that. Well, I've never uh, tried that before. Uh, I. I respect that he's tested it, but I uh, I'm skeptical because uh, well, you mail you, your mail's head out too though. It is. Uh, I never know of any other way to do it though. I mean, we always do it head out. So well, most people when they do business correspondence would fold it inside, I and mean, that would be what a ah okay. You know, so that's what I guess he's talking about. I guess so. Uh, let's go to the letter. He says letters are bait. Uh, they have must have something that stands out from the mass. Every letter boils down to this. Reader wants certain things. You want reader to do a definite thing for you. And that's not always to get funds, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, your, your, Your reader glancing over his mail is much like a man in a speeding train. Something catches his eye and he turns for a better look. Once you catch that attention, you must hold it or lose the sale. Uh, you must find a point of contact with reader's interest. Some feature that will flag her attention, make your appeal stand out from the first line. 
but it won't do to yell fire. He gives the example of the drunken miner, miner who yelled fire in a saloon and everyone dead. So that's not, <laughs> don't yell fire. Uh, he, he had some, let, let me read a few of his uh, openings. I think you'll like this. And this is, shows kind of a, this is the father letter. Your father, your boy is a little shaver now. He thinks you are the most wonderful man in the world. You can fix his boat, mend, it, mend his velocipede. I guess that's an old-fashioned bicycle. Tell him wonderful stories. But it will only be 10 or 12 years until he goes to college. The fathers of the other boys, his chums, will go to see them. There will be a railroad president, perhaps, a, a banker, a governor, and you will go. And your boy will say, this is my father, boys. How will he feel then when he says that? Will he be proud of you? Well, that, that puts a lot of guilt on. <laughs> I guess I'm not going. Gee. That's, that's, uh, that's one thing. Here, here's to a merchant. This is an excellent example of self-interest. Quote, she didn't buy anything, unquote. How often is this little tragedy repeated in your store? Your time is valuable. Your overhead expense runs on, and it costs you real money when a prospective customer walks out of your store without making a, a purchase. And he goes on like, you know, 20 of these to doctors, you know, everybody. Uh, those are some of his, uh, you know, baits to get you, in, you involved. You know, you kind of think, uh, he tells you a little bit of story. If you're a merchant, well, you know, that is a problem I have, people coming in and not buying. Am I doing anything wrong? Well, I think he does a good job of uh, putting himself in the position of his reader. Right. And what the reader's problem is. The, uh, the next chapter is how to arouse that acquisitive feeling. Decide what feeling you want to arouse in donor. He gives like a, a list of seven or so. And, and the creative feeling that impels the reader to, you know, buy or donate in our cases. Better to appeal to emotion than intellect, even when selling something like H.G. Wells' Outline of History. And he shows both examples, maybe like a more intellectual approach and one that uses bait, as he would call it, emotion and bait. But it's still kind of intellectual and how much better the one with the latter does. So it's interesting. He says, why is it some tabloid newspapers outsell respectable newspapers 10 to 1? He says it's emotion. There's, there's no doubt about that. And why is it that Billy Sunday and Amy McPherson outdraw more educated clergy? Of course, those were the, the two you know, really big draws, I don't know, 100 years ago. He says it's, it's, uh, it's emotion. It's emotion. You see uh, you know, somebody like Joel Osteen. You know, you have emotion. He also, he also has a message that's calibrated. There's a hunger for that message. Now, you can, you can criticize that message uh, all you want, but there are certainly elements of that message that you probably would incorporate into your sermons if you're, that, that you were comfortable with, you know what I'm saying? Well, I haven't uh, watched too much of him on TV but uh, before I flipped the channel, but uh, I know enough that he fills that 20,000 arena he that he's got. And he's, he says he likes to start with a joke, so I usually stay with it as long yeah. as the joke is there before I flip the station. To sell a book of etiquette, he made people fear they were doing something that was gauche that would embarrass them. So that was that was how he did it. The book of etiquette wasn't selling, but then he, he appealed to people's fears. And that kind of reminds me of that famous teaser, do you make these mistakes in English? That was a, a Max Saxon ad. You know, of course, oh, I'm worried. a lot of people are insecure. You know, maybe uh, they're not as educated, or even if they are, am I making some mistake that makes me look like a, a bumpkin? You know, so that's that's why that. Yeah, happened. you're recording this, so I better not say anything more. <laughs> he talks about word pictures. You know, many many letters uh, fail because of poor visualization. He talks about the six prime motives that make people buy. He says love, gain, duty, pride, self indulgence, self preservation. Then he has this uh, what I call a buggy letter. Now we don't. Have you ever read a buggy letter before? Is that about insects? <laughs> no, no. It's, you need raid or something? This is this is before there were cars. Dear sir, Mr. Smith, our factory manager, just came in with your inquiry on, of January 1st. He read it in, to me and said, You remember Mr. Jones, don't you? He stands pretty high over there in Jonesboro where he lives. Lots of folks know him. If Mr. Jones could drive one of our buggies around and tell his friends and neighbors who made it and how well satisfied he is with it, we could sell a lot more buggies in that neighborhood uh, this coming year. Then he suggests an idea which I know will please you miss immensely, Mr. Jones. Here it is. I'm having made to order for my own personal use just about the finest buggy that money can buy. Here's a blueprint of it. See the extra strength I've built in the wheels? Nope. The triple ply springs that made riding easier. Mr. Smith just said, Mr. Jones would surely be delighted 
with a buggy like yours. Why don't you offer him this one? You can make another for yourself. So it's uh, as an example of uh, you know psychology uh, used there. Uh, he has another example of, of clothes and, and stuff like that. He's very very good. Uh, let's talk about uh, testimonials as bait. I know I know you you have a, have some opinions on testimonials. Uh probably. But what are they? No, no. you you don't. He says this. And I know you're the <laughs> He says, I got to mess with you, Jim. <laughs> okay. He says, this is funny. He says, celebrity endorsements have a bad odor of late. <laughs> so even 100 years ago, <laughs> celebrity endorsements had a bad odor. It, they work better if there's a connection, if it seems like it's sincere, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. I. Uh, it doesn't look like they're just doing it because they got paid or something. Yeah, I think that's certainly true in the commercial end. And uh, I also, uh, when I think about uh, fundraising, uh, I remember something I, I got years ago uh, from Gregory Peck. Right. And uh, I forget the organization, but uh, they're basically trying to fight uh, racial injustice in the South. And he talked about, as a young man or even as a child, the horror of seeing a cross burning. Mm -hmm. And so he's telling that story, and it just fits so well with this organization. And he, rather than just giving Mr. Peck something to sign that anybody could have signed, oh, this is a great group, this is what they do, so He's money. a great signer because he was in that movie. He, yes, he was. And um... To Kill a Mockingbird. To Kill a Mockingbird, of course. <laughs> Harper Lee wrote the book. Yeah, so I uh, I thought, gee, this is, and I, I read the whole letter, and I was very impressed. You know, it was really, I mean, I could almost hear Gregory Peck talking. Oh, that's great, yeah. You know, it was, it was that good. Mm -hmm. So that's a case where I think in fundraising, having the celebrity sign is is a great thing. If it's a thing where the celebrity, to me now, is just somebody that you're not really using in the letter that just about anybody could have signed it, they just put their name on it, I just don't think that that has the credibility to it. I haven't seen those things work well, and the donors that give to it gave because of the celebrity, not because of the loyalty to the organization. I think if you're going to have something like that, it's better to use the publisher's note and have the celebrity there just as a, an aside. That's just my opinion. Well, I think you're right. He contrasts celebrity endorsements with testimonials from regular people. They tend to believe more. People believe, for instance, in these uh, TripAdvisor evaluations or Yelp ratings, even though many of them are actually fake, you know. Uh, but the people put a lot of stock in that. So testimonials, uh, having a, a board maybe, uh, things that 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 does that, that people know some of the people uh, can help. Uh, I saw something interesting. You know, we we talked. He talks about guarantees a lot. And of course, we don't do that in fundraising much. But I just saw a Heritage Foundation mailing that had a guarantee. It offered. It gave me a, a, a calculator, and with their logo, and said that if 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 I wanted my uh, gift back for any reason, they would do so. So I haven't really? seen that. Yeah, I did. That's not something. That's interesting. I uh, I have had uh, a nonprofit group uh, give people their donations back just because uh, it's the young heirs uh, contacting and saying Grandma is sick now, and she's giving you all this money, and they're kind of they they were kind of nasty about it, and they didn't ask for the money back, but my client asked for a computer printout of the. The grandma's uh, contributions over the years, and there were five of them, as I recall. And he wrote a very nice letter to the the heir, saying, "You know, I'm sorry to hear that she's having medical difficulties. Our records show that she's given five times for this total amount." He had all the dates there, and they cut a check. Really? And uh, but I'm not really sure that that adds any reason to give, does it? I think it's just good well, business practice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it shows so it shows confidence. Um, that particular organization, of course, had a change in leadership. So I don't know if that's. I mean, I wish the the last 
congressional candidate I gave money to <laughs> the, had a satisfaction likely. guarantee. Yeah, yeah, sure. They're not likely to do that. He talks a lot about salesmen, like like a yacht salesman. They won't. They don't crudely ask for money. And what they'll do is he is he, uh, he invites you and your wife to a party with similar people, and while there he shows you what the uh, yacht can do. And you kind of envision what it would be like. And that makes many more sales. Like a car salesman, they'll let you have it for the weekend, maybe. Or, and he takes it even to, a, to a, you know, try it for a week, try it for a month. You get it back for any reason, that kind of stuff. It, it, it lowers the bar, lowers people's fear. You put the risk on yourself rather than the, the donor or the buyer. And that works wonders. Well, I've been getting a lot of things. It's almost weekly now. I don't know what people think that I've got a lot of money or something that... Uh, well, you are you are the, uh, you know, a legend in the field. Oh. So that must be it. Well, I've been getting uh, a lot of offers from uh, investment in advisors and wills and estates to come to some fancy restaurant in the area and... Uh, Is it La Berge? Yeah. I got one too. Oh, well then how, how special not, could it be? You're not as exclusive as you thought. I'd probably be seated next to you. Jim, what are you doing here? Stuart, what are you doing here? I don't feel exclusive at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, he said to avoid the curse of manana. You know, in other words, you want to give, pe give people off the fence. You don't want to give anybody a reason to delay their decision. When you, when you get them close to the decision, pull them over. Kind of like a tug of war. You want to pull them over to your side. Well, that's a real important thing. I, I, uh, I know that there's instances where people say, oh, yeah, I, I like this I thing. I'll deal with it later. And they don't deal with it. They just get lost sure. into something else because they've lost the emotion. They've lost the story. They've lost uh, their conviction to buy. It's like they almost have to start over. So there's a lot of truth in that. And the big question, especially for a fundraiser, is how to motivate, but motivate now. Yeah. And that's, that's really tricky and where a lot of emotion has to come in. And it, has to, it, it can be credible emotion. I mean, if, if, you're, if your group has an emergency, a real emergency, you know, there's uh, flooding in Texas or inoculations needed in Ghana. I mean, that can be that can be very real. You know, 37 people are dying a day if they could only have the inoculation or something. But it's uh, it's a lot trickier for the regular group, a museum or uh, just a veterans group. So that you've really got to put some effort into getting that gift now. Next, he talks about how to put a hook into your letter. He says you will lose sale if you don't spur to action or provide a penalty. Of course, this has fundraising uh, applications for a museum, for instance. You might have uh, a grand opening or a certain date, something needs to be done, and a penalty. Maybe you, you won't get your hat or whatever it is if you don't respond at a, at a particular time. It's his last chance, scarcity, few left. He, he, he uses a lot of these words. Mm -hmm. And and this work is people's fear of losing out. You know, it's just a... Uh, Sheldini talks about that a lot in his book, Influence. It's it's a strong human emotion. He says a successful close has has two, two, two parts, persuasion and inducement. And the inducement, you might have the, the benefit, like you have a fast response bonus is a, a big part of some, a lot mm -hmm. of your mailings. Or maybe a penalty, you know, this, this is the last chance we're not going to be offering this again that kind of thing uh, well that's tough to do that it's harder to do with fundraising but it's not impossible yeah i i can i there, can there are times that. when you can do that i mean if you have the 150th anniversary of gettysburg it's it's going to happen it happened in july 4th uh 2013 you know yeah. I mean? it's, it's gone you know? well i i think too uh some of the direct mail i've seen I'd be happy if they had even one of those two elements. Well, that's true. <laughs> It'd be good. <laughs> you know, they're, 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 it just gets back to screaming money and we need it now. No and flattery. It's an emergency. All, all me, me, me. No, you, you, you. Yeah. Uh, it just doesn't have anything that makes me feel connected. Right. 
Well, I'd like to read his doctor letter, and then I, which did well, but I, then I'd like to talk about something that really uh, made it succeed. Dear doctor, will you do me a favor? For several years now, you know, we've been selling physician's leather bags by mail at a saving of good many dollars from the usual retail price. This year, we have changed the bags so radically, arranged the pockets and the insides so conveniently for doctors that I honestly believe no physician or surgeon can examine one without wanting it for his own. Just listen on one side, and then he describes it in, in, in detail, several paragraphs. Which brings me to the favor. I want to make sure that of the demand or lack of demand before we sink too much money in this new handbag. So I've come to you with this favor. Will you try out one of these doctor handbags for, for, for me for a week? Use it. See how convenient, how time-saving, saving, how handsome it is, how it compares with bags you've had, uh, you've bought for 12 or $15, and then write me. Needless to, to say, I'll send you our n n newest and finest bag made of tough, outer grain cowhide, the kind that wears for years with richness and appearance that will not look out of place in the most exclusive hat home on the avenue. At the end of the week, if you should, should like the bag so well that you want to keep it, you can send me not the, the 12 or $15, but only seven ninety five. Otherwise, just send it back at our expense, and it's in, in payment for the week's wear. Tell me frankly your honest opinion of the bag and its saleability. Naturally, I'm not making offers like this to everyone. So whether you accept it or not, I should feel obliged if you return the card so as to ensure against it falling into other hands. Now, I, I should interject. That is something we have used in fundraising. Uh, you know, the old Ben Brannock appeal. You know, he's sending, you got to send the letter back, the two-way. You probably, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Naturally, to you, your opinion will, will be of value to me only if I get it now, before we are definitely committed for any great quantity of these new model handy bags. Won't you there fill out, and it goes on there. This did well, but he did something now, next that really just, 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 you know, rocketed to success. And that is, he put a pen with a name the person's the doctor's name in like raised gold lettering as an inducement to get it. And that really, people really wanted that. Of course, uh, we learned that from Claude Hopkins as well. So that's an interesting, it's an interesting one. Um, the ideal sales letter, letter is like this chapter 25. I said there's 26 chapters. He says envelopes change based on novelty and other factors. Write as long as needed to tell your story and answer all objections. 26, how to raise money by mail. He, he was like one of the first people that uh, put a penny pasted on a letter uh, to talk about the compounding of money and then the, the, the danger of the national debt. They were worried about the national debt 100 years ago. So I, w I wonder what they're thinking about now. They're rolling over in their <laughs> graves. He said stats don't impress. One victim does. Appealed to motion before I'll interlect. He said that again. And before and after pictures. And I kind of think of Smile Train and... and, uh, and oh, they do know, a nice job. And the animals of that. Yeah. Well, anyway, I would recommend... I'm going to give you this book for a while because I owe you a book. <laughs> it's changed. Well, we'll trade. <laughs> yeah, Jim, uh, <laughs> Jim has one of my marketing books, folks. <laughs> <laughs> what was that quote that, of the guy that... that, that uh, the oh, uh, Anatoly Franz or France. He said, never lend books for no one ever returns them. The only books in my library are the ones other folk have lent me. <laughs> so I trust Jim. I know where he lives. So, <laughs> so the, uh, the way to read this book it is, is maybe a chapter or two today to really study the letters. What I most like is he'll, he'll show one that's, that, that performed okay or maybe poorly, mm -hmm. and then he contrasts that with one that, that worked well. And you can study what, what, what were the motivating factors, why was that, and that's useful. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I might just say as a PS to your listeners here, uh, a wise vice president at a... Uh, an agency that I worked at many years ago, I, I'd come back from a seminar that the company had closed the office and sent like 30, 35 people to. And he said, did you come away with one idea? And I was new to the company. I was just taking everything in, but no, I didn't come away with an idea. He said, uh, when I go to something like that, he says, I try to come away with one idea that I can test for a client. And I never forgot that, and that's been very good advice. So if you read the Robert Collier letter book, and maybe you try to come away with an idea for each chapter or, you know, each section that you're reading, uh, if it if it 
any of the times that you're spent self-educating, if you can come away with something that you can test for a client, I think it's a worthwhile use of your time. I'd just like to finish with these two quotes from Robert Collier. The mere fact that you have obstacle, obstacles to overcome is in your favor. So you should, you should, you, do you like having obstacles? Not really, no. <laughs> That's in your favor, though. And then he says, success is the sum of small parts repeated day in and day out. You know, that's that's. I think that's true, uh, especially uh, since I'm trying to lose some weight right now. There so. it is. Just try to have a good day. Yeah. And put put more and more uh, together. Well, anyway, uh, listeners, till next time, you be on the lookout. I'll, I'll be telling you more about the book, but uh, it was good talking to you. Robert, call your letter book. Uh, it's easy to order, worth reading. Definitely make that investment of time. Thank you. Till next time. Bye.